Professor Robert Beast, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I am thrilled to have you on with me. I am thrilled to be here, Mahan. I really am. Now, I have to tell you, Bob, many of the people that I interview on Tuesdays, they're change makers in the greater Washington, D.C. region. Quite a few of them I have known since the mid 90s. So mm -hmm. we talk about the relationship over all those years. And many of the people that I interview on Thursdays are thought leaders that have had a significant impact on my thinking. But when I think about those two groups, you had an impact on me back in the early 1990s <laughs> and your leadership insights have had a bigger impact on me than anyone else, which is why I am absolutely thrilled to have this conversation with you and share some of your leadership and insights with the partnering leadership community. Thank you for your kind words, Mahan. I, I am, you are generous and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So Bob, whereabouts did you grow up and how did your upbringing impact the kind of person uh, and leader that you've become? Well, actually, I'll, I'll go back to the very beginning. I was actually uh, born in South Dakota. Uh, both my parents are from South Dakota. I was born in Vermilion, South Dakota, which is about 90 miles south of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And, um, and then we sort of migrated to here in South Dakota, Billings, Montana, then ultimately Seattle, which is my hometown. And I'm passionate about my hometown. I love Seattle. So I grew up in Seattle, about two miles north of SeaTac Airport. I used to wave at the planes uh, when they were landing. Um, but I was one of four boys, lived in the suburbs. And then when I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Washington for my undergraduate degree. And I went there with the sole mission, I was gonna become a lawyer because I was, it was the 60s and early 70s. And it was about social justice, needed to change the world, do right. You know, Dr. King, all those sort of Bobby Kennedy, uh, Cesar Chavez, all those things, the social justice. So I go to the University of Washington. I said, I'm gonna get into the business school, get an accounting degree, because that will help me get the analytical framework. Yes, I know, look at an accounting degree. And then I took a class when I was a junior. Vern Buck was my professor in a course on human relations. And he got, to see, got me to see that my passion for justice could also be pursued in justice or injustice in the workplace. I could focus on those issues there. So that sort of derailed me. But the earlier roots of that, that sense of justice before Vern Buck changed the trajectory of my life, I grew up my mother. Uh, always um, focused me on those who are excluded, not feeling they weren't part of the group and pay attention to those individuals. So I picked that up from my mother, the deep sense of how people get treated fairly and with respect. So then I decided, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get an MBA because that's a step towards a PhD. So I got my MBA at the University of Washington. I took every PhD course that was available. So I'm hanging out with PhD students, but I'm loving it, but I'm still focusing in on justice. Cecil Bell, uh, the late Cecil Bell and the late Bill Scott had huge influences on my thinking around justice in, in very profound ways. Um, and then I decided to go, uh, I applied to PhD programs, uh, got into different ones across the country and chose to go to Stanford University. Uh, so I'm, I'm a West Coast kid, okay? This is really dressed up for Bob to just have a, a you know shirt on and no tie. Um, but I went to Stanford and that dramatically changed my life. I had the opportunity to study with some of the great minds uh, outside of the business school. Inside the business school, I had Joanne Martin, Gene Webb, Hal Levitt, a whole set of people who really shaped my thinking. Um, and then I was able to study with Albert Bandur, the, the founder of social learning theory, who's not only a great researcher, he's a good person. Uh, profound influence the way I think about how people learn. Uh, studied with Jim Martz, who was probably the most gifted scholar I've ever hung around with. I mean, just unbelievable, uh, gifted man. Um, and Dick Scott in the sociology department, uh, Phil Zimbardo, J. Merrill Carl Smith in the psych department, those individuals who shaped my thinking. Bob, now I love your focus on social justice and it has run throughout your career, your research, what you teach your students about. However, when people think about business school and business school professors, they don't necessarily associate uh, social justice and those aspects that you've been an advocate of for so many years with the way business leaders think, partly because there has been so little progress, not in terms of the way business leaders speak, but with respect to how organizations and leaders behave. So why do you think there is that disconnect, both in terms of perceptions of what a business school represents and promotes, and then with respect to the actions of leaders in organizations. 
Let me go back in history to tell you how I got into social justice and teaching and then come to your questions, which I think are really important questions and valid questions. And I, it was in 1986 um, and my wife um, was then fiance, now wife. Um, we were walking through Lincoln Park in Chicago and all of a sudden I'm seeing three or four homeless people in Lincoln Park. And there was this moment in time where it just, it just hit me like a thunderbolt uh, and saying, what are you doing with your life? And out of that came the inspiration to do a project in my power and politics class course at Northwestern's Kellogg School. So this is a bunch of MBAs, you know, we're all that, you know, marketing types, finance types, going to make hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Um, and I built into the power and politics class a, what we now call a Georgetown community-based learning, that if you go out into the community, you work on projects. And I, my argument was in order to understand power, you had to understand what it's like to be powerless. So I want you to work with people who are down and out disadvantaged in Evanston or the broader Chicago area. And then how do you work with them? Understand their, their experiences. And then, I, and, and then how can you help them lobby on their behalf, advocate on their behalf, try to, get, try to get resources for them. So I really wanted to see not just in a case study, but in real life, how to work the system and realize the system is not always open to issues of social justice, which then gets me here to Georgetown. Since I've been here at Georgetown, every year I focus on social justice as a major part of all my courses, uh, whether it be the first year seminar I teach on heroes and villains, to my ethical leadership class and executive MBAs. And the argument that I make, when people hear the word social justice, they oh, well, that has nothing to do with business. It has everything to do with business. We call it at Georgetown, business with social impact. Business with social impact. And one of those dimensions is social justice. Right now, all the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and belonging, that sense, all that sort of stuff, for me, is part of social justice. For you globally around the world, particularly in Europe, it's not just are they judged on their um, economic or profit, they're also judged on their environmental uh, aspects, and you can also argue how they deal with social issues. They're judged across three or four different metrics, and here in the States, um, they see those in things as really, we're only about the money. And it's not about stakeholders, it's about shareholders. And that's always been the dominant ideology going back to Milton Friedman way back in the other century. Um, and I think now the broader stakeholder, but I think now the way you get to business leaders about this, uh, because in this moment of time with the pandemic, but also um, the um, systemic racial injustice, George Floyd or all the other individuals, there is more awareness. I'm not quite sure it's translated into culture change because what you're really trying to do is change the culture of an organization to be open to these. Here's the way that I would make the case. I would make the case that there's a business case for social justice. You make the bottom line. I asked my son once in, in making this case, uh, my son, Brian, I often talk to my son, Brian, and my daughter, Kelly, for insights and advice on different things. And I always listen to young people. That's my decision with young people. Just, I, I, that's why I love teaching undergraduates. I love the executives. But yeah, teach me young people. He said, dad, what you need to do is they need to see that what you're trying to argue for can become a bullet point on their resume. And so they see the self-interest, which leads me to when I talk about ethical leadership as I do in the executive MBA program or on all the other aspects of my, my, my class in courage and moral leadership or in my class in imagination and creativity, we would focus on creative solutions for social justice as well. For me, it's, it's, it's about understanding the role of power and influence, and it's about self-interest. If you want to move people to action, you've got to figure out what's in their self-interest. Hence my son, Brian, saying they have to see it as a bullet point on their, um, on their resume. Um, and my daughter gives me similar insights about creative solutions, a way to frame things. Um, and, 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 the, and the consulting firm she works with, or, which are really one of the more inclusive consulting firms in the world. And she gives me a lot of great ideas, but it's that piece about self-interest. So that's the irony of this. In order for them, people to do right, they had to figure out it's in their self-interest, okay? Uh, you can gild it with Mother Teresa, Malala motives around the, around the edges to make it feel good, but they have to see what's in it for them. And I'm telling you that you can make more money by focusing on social justice. There is a business case for diversity, equity, inclusion, but it's not an easy journey. That is why when I teach my Heroes and Villains course, uh, I have them read A Hero of a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell's book, because I tell them they are on a hero's journey, starting at Georgetown. 
But each of these corporations, each of these leaders, I tell them they're on, they're on a hero's journey. And it's got multiple phases. And there's trials and there's tribulations. It's not easy. If it was easy, Mahan, everybody would do it. But for me, leadership it fundamentally is about understanding the role of power and how you influence and persuade people by, people by leveraging the power and influence that you have. And that was centerpiece when I created the Executive Master's in Leadership Program at Georgetown University in 2005. And I, I think, Bob, to uh, the point that you're making is that it also takes an ethical leadership and understanding what's right and pursuing what's right. One of my frustrations has been one of the consulting firms that has one of the uh, uh, most innovative thinking studies on the value of diversity on senior leadership teams doesn't have a single person of color on their own senior leadership team. So with respect to statements of the value of it on the organization, there's a lot of talk about that, but to act on it, it takes a combination of understanding the value and then the ethics and principles to follow up with action. Well, that leads me into the very simple model of leadership I operate from, Mahan. And the simple model is this, see, judge, act, and revise. See, judge, act, and revise. First off, people have to be aware they even see it. They have to see it. And often when I talk about leadership, I talk about vision as a destination. I, talk, I really focus in on storytelling and vision setting and all those sort of things, which I think is central to leadership. But they have to see it. They have to see it. If they don't see it, they're not going to act. And then once they see it and gather data, they're going to have to make some choices and judgment. Uh, and here at Georgetown, we talk about a discernment process. You sort of gather all the data and you discern really what's going on. So you have to make the judgment. Then you have to act. And I think often we make the case for social justice, only in social justice. We don't see the pragmatic goodness that could come out. You can do more than one thing. Social justice can yield economic gain. In fact, my argument is um, that I, when I, because I teach a lot of undergraduates and they all want to be entrepreneurs. Okay. And God bless them. They all want to be entrepreneurs. <laughs> and I tell them, that for me, entrepreneurship is doing the mission of social justice. And they look at me, what are you talking about, Professor Bees? Because if you create a business that creates products and services that people buy, you can hire people. And when people get jobs, they get incomes. You can look at jobs and incomes and stability of family and communities, and you're doing the work of social justice. You're doing the work of social justice. So for me to make that argument, but also understand it's culture change. And if you say we want to do DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, whatever it is you want to do, you better have the people up there that reinforce that signal. Because here's the reality. Leaders are signal senders. And if you're signaling we want to do DEI, that's our mission now. Maybe because it's in vogue. I want to see where you're a year from now. Okay, that's I always test that. You better have people up there that are symbolic of that mission going forward. It can't just be a bunch of white individuals, men or women. It has to reflect the mission you're trying to accomplish because you're a signal center. People picking up those signals real quick. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a solo episode and I talk about example and leadership and uh, how Lou Gerstner talks about the fact that uh, when he showed up with a blue collar, the 50 top executives at IBM, highly compensated, highly educated, changed the color of the collar of their shirts to match the CEOs. So the people pick out the smallest signals that leaders send. So those visuals, those behaviors make as big, if not a bigger impact and difference than right. any words the organization puts up on a wall or sends out in their uh, letter to shareholders. People are really sensitive and smart. They pick up, particularly in times of change, they're really going to hone in. Um, in fact, I tell people that when you get a new leader coming in, whether it be a team, department, whatever, and they give their, you know, meet and greet speech, just count how many times they say the word I versus the word we. And that reveals everything about them. But as you point out, Mahan, even the littlest details. And, and Gerstner also noted that at IBM that he realized at the end that change was really culture change. He was trying to change the culture. And that's, that's a four to six year proposition. It's doable but you got to have commitment, but people pick up on even those littlest things. You're absolutely right. 
Yeah, so you touched on a couple of aspects of uh, why I've loved what you've all been about. Part is social justice, part ethical leadership, which over the years, the more distance has been between my MBA at Georgetown, I've seen that play even a bigger role that, than any, with all due respect to the finance professors and accounting professors, than any of the other um, aspects. And that runs core to a lot of what you talk about. Now, you also... Uh, do a brilliant job and uh, you had us read the Tao of Pooh that you still, I believe, have your uh, students read. Part of what I want to understand is what is the message from Pooh and the Tao of Pooh that leaders can take to become more effective leaders? I think there's multiple things. In fact, I started using the Tao of Pooh when I was teaching at Northwestern. And um, it's the single most popular book I've ever assigned in my many years of teaching. And, and I chose the Tao of Pooh because it's a book by Benjamin Hoff. I highly recommend people to read it. I mean, and these are the sources I go to to connect to people because most people know who Winnie the Pooh is. I think more young people know who Winnie the Pooh is if Winnie the Pooh was a video game, but that's another conversation. <laughs> um, but the notion is Winnie the Pooh really learned he, several aspects of Pooh's approach was that he was simple-minded, but he wasn't stupid. He didn't get caught up in the complexities. Of what he did, he sort of go with the flow, see what was in front of him, look at opportunities, and then make choices. And all the choices he always made were for his friends, Piglet, Rue. He was always looking out for them. But for me, it's an approach to, to creativity and innovation. Uh, so for example, uh, he said, Hoff writes, or Lao Tzu writes, the Chinese philosopher, you want to uh, return to the beginning, become like a child again. I want people in terms of change and innovation, particularly creative innovation, to go back to becoming a child again, okay, to see the word, world simply. And you have to go with the circumstances and listen to your own intuition. Listen to your intuition. Follow it up a data collection, but listen to your intuition. Um, and we spend so much time working fast and, and getting, you know, trying to be busy, busy, busy. And we really don't accomplish anything. Sometimes we confuse um, activity with progress. And what Pooh does is he looks at things as it is, surveys it, and then goes, he's always collaborating. So for me, one of the aspects of Pooh is he's always co-creating his reality with all of his friends. Okay. And he's even nice with Owl. Okay. Who doesn't always appreciate the wisdom <laughs> of Pooh. Um, and sometimes they're just all in front of us, but we need to make use of it. We're always looking for something else, but something is always right. And Pooh is always about that, but he goes to circumstances. Um, and one of the things about Pooh is doing nothing is doing something. And that's a challenge I make to all of my students, executive and undergraduates and the corporate executives or government executives I work with. Can you find 15 minutes a day just for silence? No, no Apple ear, ear, ear pods in. No, 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 no. Just silent. And that's what Pooh was really good. And one of the things that's really quite clear, you know, the, the wise know their limitations, the foolish do not. And Pooh knew his limitations. And he worked within those limitations. And he, and he went on adventures. It wasn't like he was, he was always going on adventures. And he would think in ways that would seem the opposite of this sort of linear thinking, but he'd always get back. And so for me, that's appropriate for this world we live in, this VUCA world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And you have to become more Pooh-like and understand the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And you have to take those steps. Um, sometimes I think we confuse, well, I think we need to focus on progress, not perfection. We need to focus on direction, not distance. That was what Pooh was all about. And, and I learned that last piece, direction, not distance, from my wife. I was playing golf with her in a local public course in, in Maryland where I live. And I was up there. I had my new clubs out. Okay. And my, by the way, I started when I was six. She started, she started when she was six. I started when I was 36. And guess who's better? She is. <laughs> and, and so I, I hit this beautiful shot. My, my big Bertha Callaway clubs, you know. And it's this beautiful shot. I was Tigeresque in its arc. And, and I was walking. It, it was beautiful. Wrong fairway. And my wife said to me, Bob, it's direction, not distance. If you hit the ball straight, you about cut your strokes in about half. And that piece of wisdom, I think, lives out in poo. If we just get straight, figure out our way back, even if we reach, we'll figure it out. But he never got worried, intense. He always knew that it would take care of. Um, and, you know, John Lennon once said, um, 
it'll be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And I think Pooh lived that out, very Pooh-like. So for me, it's looking at reality as it is, appreciating everybody around you, the talents and the gifts of everybody, and everybody, and that's the virtue of the characters that A.A. Milne created. They all had certain attributes and characteristics, but it was Pooh bringing them together in a collaborative culture. I know most people say, I didn't read that Winnie the Pooh. Read the Dow Pooh, and that's exactly what's happening. Okay, but he would he would collaborate and co-create and always achieve success. And then what ha- what is the meaning of success? This is a question that I pose to executives. And what is the meaning of success? Um, it'll probably change with as you grow older. But what's the meaning? And what was the meaning of success for Pooh? And I think part of it was the camaraderie and friendship of his friends and being together, um, that sense of community. Um, and so for me, that's why I use the Tao of Pooh. Uh, again, it's the single most popular book I've ever assigned. I encourage everybody to get a copy of it and read it. Um, it's an easy read. It's a fun read. It may bring back memories. It does It does also stick in your mind over the years. And in addition to that, uh, what I find, Bob, is that uh, Apu is a more accessible character than some of the other leaders that we read about that almost seem like they have such intellect or such capabilities that are out of reach when you read about them. So with uh, leadership, as you talked about, different factors with Winnie the Pooh as a uh, 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 reading in Tao of Pooh, uh, it's more accessible for leaders to try to uh, uh, take on some of those characteristics and learn from them rather than reading about some of the business icons that have transformed industries. Right, no, I think that that's right. Um, I'm not saying you can't learn from those business uh, icons, um, but I do think you have to go back and look at who was a leader. And most people don't view that people followed Pooh, but there was also times Pooh would follow his friends. And I think that shows that sometimes the true leader leads and sometimes the true leader is led. You have to listen. Um, but I think that who lives out, particularly in today's world where things seem to be so crazy and volatile, he knew had a confidence that we would get through. He had a confidence that people picked up on. And again, you as a leader, a signal sender and your confidence that people pick up on that, particularly in these challenging times that we we're a part of. And as we're going through these times, Bob, more people have wanted to connect with meaning and with purpose. You also did a brilliant TEDx talk, Let Your Life Speak. So you have been a big advocate for purpose, both for individuals and for organizations. How do leaders embrace purpose both for themselves and bring more purpose in leading their teams and organizations? Well, it's a great question. Um... And I do think that that's actually how the social justice concept gets embedded in today's world. We talk about leading with purpose, leading with purpose. Um, and so the notion is you got to figure out who you are and why you do what you do. And for me, that's about letting your life speak. I mean, leadership is a calling. So who are you? What are your gifts and talents? And that will change across time. And Finding the passion defines you, defines your corporation, defines your mission. You got to find the why, the mission. So the who are you and the why are absolutely critical. And a larger sense of purpose can keep people going. Uh, Nietzsche, uh, the philosopher, once said, we can endure anyhow as long as we know why. And so finding the why, keep coming back to the why. I don't say focus on plans and projects, but not just them. Focus on the why. Why do people do it? I was doing work with a financial services company um, and one of the challenges they faced, and they worked in you know, processing you know, financial instruments, life insurance and stuff like that. But they realized the why of what they do is they put a human face on what they do. So when someone in the family passes, they're not stop processing the, the insurance, they're actually helping people through a challenging time who are grieving. So they put a human face on it and they think about that, the why of what they do. So I think that who and the why is really important and letting your life speak, letting your organization unleash its greatness, because you're trying to do is unleash the greatness of everybody working there at the organization. So, Bob, how do you do that uh, with it maintaining some grounding in reality? So uh, we work as a great example, wanted to raise the world's consciousness. And 
most organizations that I interact with and I see, they do have purpose statements. And in many instances, there are these grand purpose statements of wanting to feed the world, wanting to change the world that don't necessarily connect much to the organization. How do you guide leaders to have a purpose that is closer to the core of what the organization is about rather than these grand statements that a CEO can stand up and make, but doesn't translate to reality of what the business uh, actually does, as was the case uh, with WeWork wanting to raise everyone's consciousness? Well, I think two things, it's a great question, Mon. Two things that I would do and the advice I give the executives I work with um, um, and, and that is this, that what I think you need to engage the people and, and you co-create this sense of mission and purpose. It's because the actions and the words have to align. It's one thing for you to say, we have this mission, but are people invested in it? Did they help co-create? Again, I always use the word co-create. I don't use collaborate. Although collaboration clearly is part of the co-create, but do they help co-create it? And can they see that what they're doing makes an impact on the world, but also serves the mission of the organization. Because again, people are really smart. As you pointed out earlier, Mahan, people are really smart. They're gonna look for consistency. Are this, is this one of the sort of the fad du jour, you know, social justice, or is this a real commitment? So the degree to which you've engaged people to help create the mission, co-create the mission, and they're involved in implementing that mission, you're more likely to get that. To come. And getting feedback, is it working? And are we staying true to it? And one of the ways that you, as I said, leaders are signal senders. So the question that I would ask a leader, what signals are you sending? You know, Tom Peters uh, once said, celebrate what you want to see more of. And so if we are doing wonderful things in terms of the mission, then celebrate that. Celebrate that. So that, that purpose is absolutely critical. And I love the way you put it, that co-creation helps people buy into the purpose and enables the purpose to actually be something that uh, the team can get excited about rather than words that become meaningless to the members of the organization. Now, another aspect that I know you're passionate about, in addition to leading by example, is the uh, trust plays a key role in how we can lead effectively. So uh, can you share some of your thoughts with respect to the different types of trust and how leaders can have more trust with their teams and organizations in leading them forward? Absolutely. In fact, Mahan, I talk about three different kinds of trust. Uh, I talk about personal trust. Do people trust you as a leader, they trust me as a leader. And that's a great way of thinking about trust. And that's the way we normally think about trust, that we trust in leadership. Um, but the other two kinds of trust are organizational trust and strategic trust. And organizational trust, do people trust the organizational decision-making processes? Are they understandable? Do we even know how the decisions were made? And then the third kind is strategic trust. And that is, are we doing the right things in terms of goals and strategies? Um, and those are three separate but interrelated parts, aspects of trust. And in times of change, you really have to pay attention to all three. If you have high degrees of personal trust, and I'll unpack each of these in a little bit more detail for you, Mahan. If you have a high degree of personal trust, you probably get the benefit of the doubt in the other two, organizational trust and, um, and strategic trust. But they are three separate judgments. It may be I trust you, Mahan, but I think we're going in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, <laughs> So let me talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, because I think they're really important, particularly in, in times of change, which is what we're living in. Um, for me, personal trust has three different dimensions. There's one of, called the three C's, credibility, concern, and competency. Credibility, um, what you say is what you do. Um, uh, do you tell the truth? In fact, if you look at global surveys of admired characteristics of leadership of different leaders around the world, almost always in the top three is somewhere like honesty or truth down. Okay. So they're looking at that. Um, and part of your credibility is sharing more information um, because it's the less you say, the more likely you are to be misinterpreted, the less you say. And so part of your credibility is being authentic, sincere, sharing more information. Uh, often organizations I work with people will tell me, well, it's on a need to know basis. And they tell me, I don't need to know. 
Well, that, that only <laughs> inspires distrust. If you want to inspire trust, because trust is the fundamental social currency of leadership. If you have trust, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you don't have to, otherwise you have to coerce, force, and that's just a much more challenging thing. Concern is this. Do you listen to people? Are you empathetic? Uh, the single most important leadership skill, and I know there's lots of research on it. I've read most of it. Uh, the single most important leadership skill, according to Bob, is listening. Listening is the most important leadership skill for two reasons. One is when you listen to people, <laughs> they tell you lots of stuff, but also makes people feel valued and important. Here's the insight from my current research on fairness and justice in the workplace and how people feel treated. People want to be seen. People want to be heard. People want to be understood. Now, I always remind the executives, understanding does not mean agreeing, but they want to be seen, heard, and understood. Think about that in the context going back to the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do we even see the people? Do we, do we even try to act to listen, to understand without prejudging or any biases that we all have? And we all have biases. So that notion of being seen and heard, but also part of concern is you're visible and accessible. Can they find you? Are you accessible? Uh, for example, my syllabus, because I live in a virtual world, I put my cell phone on there. I have Zoom. We want to have office that we have Zoom, whatever, whatever hour you want to, you know. And I have some students around the world, so it, it varies when we set up the Zoom call. Um, but that sense of concern, people want to know that they're cared for. If people know you care, they're much more committed to working. And in today's world, there's a sense of uncertainty around caring. And how you demonstrate caring is just the ways I talk. You listen to people, you're empathetic, you try to understand. Can you help them achieve? And the third C is, is competency. Do um, you have a solid base of knowledge, skills? And it could also be, do you have enough knowledge of the culture, whether it be a national culture, or enough of our, understand the culture of the organization and try to change it? But at the end, it's all about reliability and results. Do you meet or exceed expectations? So that's personal trust. Organizational trust is... Do people, do senior leadership communicate the same message? Because when people hear messages, particularly if they're just you know, diverse and around different parts of the world or even within the same state, if you're here in the States, they're not all hearing the same message at the same time. People are like, did you, what did you hear what I heard? Did you hear? <laughs> and if people hear a disconnect, it undermines trust. So the advice I give to executives is the more serious and important the issue, the more you're literally reading from the same script. I don't want anybody improvising, winging it. Literally read the same script. But part of what people look for in organizational trust is consistency, transparency. Do people know what the decisions, the criteria are before a decision? As I like to say, transparency is a condition before a decision. You know, the rules, the criteria, all those sort of stuff, the requirements. After the decision, we call it an explanation, okay? But people are looking for transparency. Can they see it, okay? And, and they look in that. And they also look in when, our, 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 when burdens or benefits are are uh, distributed, are they seem fair? Um, but it leads, this sort of consistency thing leads to one of the things I'm working on with a colleague. Um, I call it um, uh, treating people, uh, the justice paradox, treating people equally but uniquely. And therein lies the challenge for executives. How do you treat people equally but uniquely? Uh, my mother, when she would raise us, again, one of four boys, and, um, and she would so, she spent the same amount on us for Christmas gifts. And she would show us the receipts. My mother was pretty particular about this, but we got different gifts. That's treating people equally, but uniquely. So the equality is some level of goodness. What that goodness looks like can be different, but that's a much more challenging issue for them. You have to pay attention to their specific needs. Um, but at the end, fairness matters. People are more, nobody likes to receive bad news. I know that from my own research and my own experience. But people are more willing to live with it if they believe the process of producing it was fair. Strategic trust is, you've got to communicate that message over and over and communicate and convince people why it's the right course and how it's doable, okay? If people say, oh, this is not doable, then they just don't engage. But probably one of the things that, um, in, in one of the things that you need to do most specifically in strategic trust is dream big, because my advice is dream big, have big goals, create smaller goals, particularly new strategy, then create smaller goals, milestones where you jump over and get a success, get early victories, get early victories. Because when you get an early victory in a new strategy, a new direction it does three things for you. One, it creates a sense of confidence. Oh, we can do this. Second, 
It creates a sense of progress. Oh, we're moving. People will, are more resilient if they believe they're moving in the right direction, even if it's challenging. But here's what it does for you also. It silences the doubters and cynics who said it can't be done because you're doing it. And those are the three different kinds of trust. You know, Deming once wrote in a forward to a book before he passed, he said, trust is mandatory for the optimization of any system. I, I absolutely agree, Bob. And I would like to spend a tiny bit more time on trust, most specifically post the pandemic and crisis. The personal trust for some leaders has improved. For others, organizations have uh, uh, increased the number of tracking software in some instances that they use. So there is even less of a personal trust uh, in uh, some cases. Transparency by default in some organizations has gone down, partly because people aren't interacting with each other as much. And then specifically on the uh, strategy front, a lot of leaders tell me they have less clarity on where the organization is headed. So they feel more insecure now than they did a year ago. So they have less clarity in that strategic direction. So as organizations and leaders are dealing with crisis, how do they maintain that personal trust? How do they maintain and build transparency to have the organizational trust? And how do they communicate a, a confident a vision of the strategy when they feel so unsure of what is ahead? Well, I, for me, the way that I focus those around trust is by leading by example. And I talk about the six F's, okay? And I wanna share those and then add um, some more aspects and make it a little bit more elaborate. And the first F is fortitude. You, one of the things that people are looking for in these challenging times, they want leaders who are decisive. To make a decision and to be calm. And, part, and being calm is real difficult in these times. Um, and that shows strength. But part of that fortitude is your willingness to engage your people and listen to them. And that sort of willingness to listen to them and their fears, their anxieties. Do you build in sort of ways of listening to them? Um, because empathy is key. And the, the second F is feeling. So fortitude and feeling. And you, do you spend time listening to them? In fact, one of the, the advice that I would give is have updates and progress reports. You know, keep people informed on a regular basis. And, and even if you don't have nothing new to, to report, still have that meeting, have, be there for it. Because if you stop having that meeting, people go, oh, what does that mean? Rumors start to flow because it's just, they don't see people, people go, the rumors go viral. But that sense of feeling to engage people um, but also be forthright, tell the truth. And if you don't know the answer, don't hide it. Admit when you don't know something, you'll get back to them within 48 hours. I think that sorts of fortitude, the forthrightness, the feeling, but also the follow-up, that sort of fourth F, the follow-up. Follow up when you have more information, engage people. Uh, I think what you have to do is going on a listening tour uh, and listening to your people. And you can do that virtually and you can do that face-to-face. So Bob, obviously trust is critical for leadership. I also know that you teach executives a framework for them as they look to lead more effectively. Can you tell me a little bit more about the framework for us as we are looking to become more effective, more impactful, more purpose-driven leaders? Yes, I can, Mahan. Um, I call it, let your life speak living a life of leadership. This framework that I want to sort of expand and unpack for you in a little more detail really is the framework I used when I created the Executive Master's in Leadership Program at Georgetown in 2005. Then I created a version of it for DC public school leaders, public uh, charter school leaders, and DCPS leaders. And it's really the framework I talk about. For me, leadership is a calling. It's a strong urge of responsibility for others. Leadership is about who you are as much as what you do. For me, leadership is a way of life. And to live that life of leadership, you have to let your life speak. To live that life of leadership fully, you must harness the power of the three W's. 
It's the power of the who, the power of the why, and the power of the way. It's those three W's that I want to talk about more. When I work with executives, this is what I try to get them to unleash the greatness of who they are, their team, their departments, and their organization. Let's talk first about living a life of leadership and the power of the who or the power of identity. It is about igniting the fire within. Who are you? It's a discernment process, trying to say, who am I? What gifts and talents do I have to offer the world? And this is a continual process. This isn't just something you do when you graduate from college or graduate school. You have to continually come back. What are my gifts and talents? Have I realized new gifts and talents through a series of experiences? Going through this pandemic, I am sure every person listening here has discovered things about themselves they didn't even know they had the talent or the resilience or the skills to do, but they had to do it. And so discovering those skills, those talents and gifts is really important. The question that I pose is, I borrow from my favorite spiritual writer, Thomas Merton, who said, how do I make myself a valid offering to the contemporary world? A valid offering to the contemporary world. As that world shifts, how do I continue to make that valid offering? It's about finding the passion within. That's part of your identity. Who are you? What grabs your heart? What gets you excited? But it's also about igniting that fire. And your identity is your ambition. What do you want to do? Now, I know when people hear the word ambition, they probably think, Bob, slippery slope to the dark side. <laughs> no. Ambition, when aligned with self-interest, can lead you down that slippery slope to the dark side. But ambition in pursuit of something larger, which is going to get me the second W, something larger. That is where it, it's a powerful igniting of passion and energy to go lead and live more fully that life of leadership. Um, Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, which I should remind people was an entrepreneurial startup by three college roommates at the University of Paris about a little under 500 years ago. It wasn't an entrepreneurial startup. It just happened to go global. Um, but he said, go forth and set the world on fire. But that leads us to the second W. Uh, the power of the way as part of living a life of leadership. And for me, that's the power of purpose. I use language here at Georgetown, we call it in search of the magic, something more, something bigger. Um, <clears throat> and the question I keep asking the executives I work with and the students that I teach is, why do you do what you do? And it can't just be for the money. It's got to be something more. And don't lose sight of that human face, that why you do what you do. When I work with uh, school leaders, I say, let's begin with this premise. What if your purpose was this? Put students first. Wow, what does that suggest in terms of leadership and what you do? And the, and the school leaders I dealt with this past year have done heroic work. Um, but it's about finding that grander purpose. What's that larger purpose that gets you animated? And I love the phrase animate. What gets you excited? This larger purpose. What is your personal mission statement? Do you have a personal mission statement? You should have a personal mission statement. I happen, my personal mission statement is, I have two parts to it. One is I want to change the world one student at a time. That's my mission. And I want to unleash the greatness of who they are. That is my mission. Then I ask the question, what have you done today to make the world a better place? It may just be listening to somebody. What's that larger purpose? What keeps you going beyond getting paid? It's the purpose. It's something bigger. But it's also, for me, about... Um, living a life of leadership, the third W is the way. For me, that's about vision and action, vision and action. It's about part of this is the practical skills, the vision and action. You need to stay close to the people as a leader. You need to be visible and accessible, listening to their hopes, their fears, their anxieties. Again, as I've said before, people want to be seen. People want to be heard. People want to be understood. They know that you care, which is part of that trust piece that we talked about. One of the keen insights I've learned from my own research is if you touch people's hearts, their minds will follow. To motivate and move people during these challenging times, you need to speak in examples and stories. Let me sort of bookend the purpose and the power of the why and the way with a piece of wisdom from Jackie Robinson, uh, the great baseball player, integrated white baseball in 1947. And this is a, a, a sentence that's on his tombstone up in New York. And Jackie Robinson said this, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And that's what living a life of leadership is about, having the impact on other people's lives. And that is beautifully said, Bob. You clarify the who, the why, and the way that are critical for leaders. Now, a lot of leaders have been experiencing, as all of us have been, 
a lot of difficulties over the past year, uh, requiring even more resilience and a greater sense of purpose that's needed as we go through this turbulence. How do you guide leaders as they are focusing on their who, why, and the way to become more resilient and be able to stick to that sense of purpose leading through these times? Mahan, what I do is I go back to the power of storytelling. I'm going to talk about two different strategies when I work with leaders and, and getting them to engage in this. And the power of the storytelling is why I talk about creating positive narratives, positive narratives, which you must create and share narratives or stories about the positive things that you and your organization, your teams have done for your organization that help customers, clients in face of these challenging times. And these are stories of resilience. What I get them and I sort of lay out a very simple model about how you tell these, uh, how we talk about these positive narratives and storytelling. Positive narratives are a critical leadership strategy for energizing and engaging people during these challenging times. And what they also do is create a culture of pride because when people begin to talk about the, the stories and the, of resilience they engage in that really push forward the mission of the organization, they feel a great sense of pride about that. Because in these crazy times we're part of right now, we don't always know what's going on. Because again, what happens is that once you start hearing, wow, we're doing wonderful stuff, it gets you engaged, it gets you inspired, it gets you motivated, it creates that culture of pride. And when you're inspired, motivated, and that culture of pride, that builds resilience because we can do it. As Rosabeth Moss Cantor, the great Harvard Business School professor once said, a self-reinforcing upward spiral, performance stimulating pride, stimulating performance. And so when you hear these stories, you feel proud and you wanna go do more. It's a healthy competition to do more for the mission of the organization. And that storytelling is absolutely critical, has been for generations. It is even more important when we are stressed and the best leaders seek out those stories, nurture those stories, retell those stories. Now, in addition to that, Bob, uh, do you have any advice for how we can deal with these challenging times? I don't necessarily think this is going to end uh, in a month or in six months. There are going to be c continual disruptions, continual challenges. How do you recommend to your students, to leaders, to executives to more effectively deal with challenging times? Well, one of the things I invite them to do and suggest for them to do is something really simple at the end of each day, because uh, they live very busy days and nights. And it's what I call the three moments of joy. At the end of each day, can you sit down with family, friends, or just yourself in a journal and highlight your three moments of joy that you had? And it could be something very simple. It could be uh, that you had a really nice dinner or you had a phone call with someone you hadn't talked to in a year. Whatever that moments of joy are, just say it publicly. And if you have to say it publicly, put it in a journal and you keep track of the joys. Because here's what we know from the research and practice. The more you put positive thoughts in your mind, focusing on the positives and those moments of joy, it builds resilience. I know that this sounds simple, but it works. At the end of each day, I sit down with my wife at dinner and say, what were your three moments of joy? What were my three moments of joy? And when my kids are with us, we say, what were your three moments of joy? Or I'll email them or text them, what's your three moments of joy today? Because part of dealing with the difficult times is to find those moments of joy. And that moment, I use the word joy, that sense of happiness, a sense of, wow, what's that wow? Even if it's a small wow. And the more you keep the positive thoughts and those moments of joy, talking about, again, it's the three moments of joy each day, you'll become more resilient with time. And I love hearing that because uh, I know you practice it, every communication we've had, you have shared your moments of joy. So this is not just something that a professor or a leader tells others to do. This is something that you do yourself, Bob. In addition, obviously, to your own brilliant insights that you have shared, what are some books that you recommend to your students and executives as they want to become more purpose-driven and impactful as leaders? 
Well, some of the books, and I'll give you a website too, and some, you know, TED Talks. Um, I think in terms of books, The Leadership Challenge by Kuzis and Posner, I think is, is, a, is a good book that really sort of lays out many of the things um, that I believe in practicing and is research uh, grounded. I think also the, um, the Parker Palmer book, Let Your Life Speak, um, Answering the Call of Vocation, I think is a really profound book. Uh, Robert Cole's book, Lives of Moral Leadership, Men and Women Who Make a Difference. Uh, again, I'll go back to the Tao of Pooh, which we talked about earlier uh, as, as a great book, or even Denise Recursion's book uh, about 40 MacArthur Fellows called uh, Uncommon Genius, I think is a great read um, about that. Uh, but also I go to, if you want a website to go to, go to tompeters.com. Tom's a really smart guy. Many of his things are on there, uh, are free resources. He's one of the smartest individuals in the last 40 some years on management and leadership. Um, you can go listen to um, um, TED Talks by Simon Sinek or Brene Brown. Those individuals who will keep that sort of positive focus going. But also what I like the people to leave with is some final sage wisdom. Uh, not just those resources, which are really, I think, useful resources and I access. Um, but I also think pieces of wisdom I want him to, to, live, to leave this conversation with, uh, which, by the way, has been one of my moments of joy today. Uh -huh. um, the first piece of wisdom is from Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs said this, innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity, not a threat. And so the challenge to every leader I work with, including those I work with at Georgetown University, is we've had to innovate this past year. Which ones are you going to keep? Which ones are you going to keep? And I think that's the way, how do you view change? It's not a threat. It's an opportunity to innovate. The other piece of wisdom, because I talk a lot about co-creation, it's a Japanese proverb. It's one of my favorites. And the Japanese proverb is this, none of us is as smart as all of us. None of us is as smart as all of us. And two more pieces of sage wisdom, then a third bonus piece, my last one. <laughs> the first one is from Francis of Assisi. And Francis of Assisi said this, start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible. And suddenly you're doing the impossible. The next to last is from Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela said this, it always seems impossible until it's done. And the last piece of wisdom, perhaps one of my favorite proverbs, if not my favorite proverb, it's an African proverb. And the African proverb goes like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And to achieve mission success, to go far, you need to go together. Thank you, Mohan. Well, Robert Bees, you have absolutely been a moment of joy both for me today and for our listeners across the country and across the globe. So I truly appreciate you sharing some of your leadership insights and wisdom with the partnering leadership community. Thank you so much, Professor Robert Beese. Thank you.